大家好，我是 Jack， 我是 Anne。今天我们要讨论《后裔骑兵》这部 Netflix 的影集。这是一部非常脍炙人口的西洋棋影集。我们小时候大概五六岁左右就开始下西洋棋了。我们也上过很多专业的西洋棋课程。在这次的影片中，我们会跟大家说明到底什么是后裔骑兵 （The Queen's Gambit）， 以及我们也会分析这部影集对西洋棋的诠释是否正确。影片结尾，我们还会跟大家说，之后我们还会拍的主题。如果大家对这些有兴趣的话，别忘了开启小铃铛、订阅我们、按赞或是分享我们的影片哦。接下来我们一样都会用英文，所以你们要练习英文的话，就开英文字幕或是不开任何字幕。如果你只想看中文的话，那就开中文字幕就好喽。The Queen's Gambit. Yeah, great question. Well, first of all, I think all of you know that there are、uh, king pieces and the queen pieces in chess, and、uh, the front row is the pawns, right? So we can actually call the pawn in front of the king the king's pawn. We can call the pawn in front of the queen the queen's pawn. And the queen's gambit is a type of opening for white. It's some of the opening moves that white can make, and it starts with white moving the queen's pawn out to the middle of the board. And often black might respond by moving their queen's pawn into the middle of the board. And after that, white moves the pawn in front of the queen's bishop out to the middle of the board. Now in chess,、uh, pawns can only capture to the diagonal. They can't capture ahead of them. So actually, white is offering this pawn to be captured by black. That is why it is a gambit. A gambit is a kind of situation in chess where you offer to sacrifice something, but. Usually, you sacrifice something to get a different kind of advantage. In this case, with the queen's gambit, if black accepts the gambit, they go ahead and take the pawn. Then white can continue by moving the king's pawn into the middle of the board. You can see that if this black pawn were still here, then white would not want to move the king's pawn forward. Black could just capture it. Instead, white is opening up the middle for their pawns. And this is good for white because in chess, you would like to control the middle of the board. That's right. Usually, the player who has the stronger control over the middle of the board has a little bit more power over the direction of the game. Not always, but it's a good principle to follow. Now this is the situation where black accepts the gambit; they take the pawn.、Uh, also, it's very common to not accept the gambit, and then you have this position. It's black's move.、Uh, a very common answer is to move out this pawn, and then white might move out、uh, the queen's knight, and the game will continue from here. But this position is the basics for the queen's gambit. So you can use the word gambit outside of chess. If you're making some kind of sacrifice to get ahead, you can say you're gambiting something.、Mm -hmm. 
By the way, this is just one opening out of literally hundreds of different openings that have been created, and there are many more gambits too. The opening is an extremely important part of chess because it often determines which player will have the initiative or the most control over the board. If you are interested in learning more chess openings, then definitely stay tuned because we'll talk about more of them in the future. So let's talk a little bit about is the chess per trade in the Queen's Gambit accurate? Yeah, that's a great question. And overall, I think it is. They did a lot of careful preparation for this series. It's very interesting to watch the behind the scenes footage. They talk about how they made everything authentic to life in the 1950s. Going back to the chess in the series, they actually brought multiple grandmasters. Now, a grandmaster is the highest level of master that you can reach in chess. So they brought multiple grandmasters onto the set to help prepare and check all of the chess for the series. And some of the chess really was played. The final game that Beth plays against Vasily Borgov, that was actually based on a real game that two grandmasters played. They only changed a few of the moves in the game for the series. If you are interested in watching a commentary about that final game, there is a great video made by the famous chess YouTuber Agadmator that goes through all of the moves. He explains it really well. If you're interested, I'll put a link to it. And also, there's a video of Magnus Carlsen, who's the current world champion, sharing his opinion about this series. And he thinks it's good. Yeah, that's right. The only thing that he thought was a little unrealistic is that Beth spent about six years away from playing tournament chess, and then as soon as she came back, she started beating everybody and <laughs> rising to the top in the world. Maybe that part is a little less realistic, but he thought that everything else was well done and very enjoyable. So what about players tipping over their kings at the end of the game? Is that realistic? And I know we saw a lot of that in the series, right? The player just puts their king on their side when they give up. Uh, this is one way that you can resign in chess. That's what we call it, resigning. Uh, but it's actually not really the most common way. I think you might see it in more lower level tournaments, maybe kids tournaments, they would do that. But the most common way to resign in professional chess is simply to extend your hand. Uh, this is the way if you don't want to verbally say, I resign, you just extend your hand and that's the symbol. We. <laughs> or what you can also do, the professional players, they have a score sheet on the side and when you give up, you can simply write on your score sheet, resigns, or write the final result of the game. The common way of showing who won and who lost in professional chess now is to put the kings in the middle of the board. And I noticed that they didn't really do this in the series. Uh, I'm not sure when it started. Maybe it hadn't started by the 1950s. You put both of the kings on the middle white squares if white won. You put both of the kings on the middle black squares if black won. And you put the kings on both of the white side middle squares if it was a draw, if it was a tie. There was no winner for the game. And then you just leave the kings there and that shows the official of the tournament that that was the final result of the game. So we'll share more details like this in future videos. Make sure you don't miss them. Here are some of the future topics that we're going to talk about in the next videos. There are some common mistakes a lot of videos and ads make about chess. We also want to tell you about some online chess websites and chess apps that you can use for free to start playing and start learning more. And you definitely need someone to tell you how to use the app so you don't become frustrated. We will also talk more about the basics of chess, the chess openings that I mentioned, chess principles. What are the general ideas that you should follow to become good at chess? We can talk about some of the advanced chess rules, tournament play, blindfold chess. There is so much. We'll also talk about some idioms and words from chess. 
That's right, there are a lot of them that have made their way into the English language and we use them all the time in everyday life. Some of the other things we're going to talk about, chess history, how chess and politics are related. You saw some in the series, right? The relationship between the US and the Soviet Union. That really happened and it's a very interesting story. And also, what about the culture of different types of chess? For instance, Western chess and Chinese chess. How are they different? We'll also share some famous chess movies. You definitely don't want to miss that. Yeah, that's a good one. Thank you for watching. Here's a question for today's video. What do you think about the Queen's Gambit? You can leave your answer in the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe and click on that notification bell so you don't miss our next chess video. 大家别忘了订阅我们的频道，记得要开启小铃铛才会收到我们接下来新影片的通知哦。We'll see you next time. Until then.